In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If. If is a commonly used word in our language, and what it lacks in length, it makes up for in its impact. Its use most often precedes, presents a condition, a term, or an agreement. It can change the entire direction of a sentence or a conversation or even an entire relationship. When someone says if, it points to at least some degree of uncertainty or an incompleteness of some kind. Peter, James, and John had just witnessed the glory of Jesus as he was transfigured before them. In that moment, his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. He showed them that he is God in our human flesh, and he spoke with Moses and Elijah, who had appeared before him and before these three apostles. Despite Peter's suggestion that they remain on the mountain, they made their way back to civilization, and on their way back they received a charge from Jesus that they tell no one about what they had seen. With this command in mind, they return to find an argument involving the scribes and the other nine apostles. A crowd is watching the back and forth between these two parties, and his presence brings it all to a close. Immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what were you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. As we have seen elsewhere in the gospel narratives, a debate is taking place in Jesus' absence. This young boy's father is looking for release, and yet the disciples are not able to deliver it. The crowd sees Jesus and finds great relief, no doubt hoping that he can bring about an end to this commotion. There is nothing greater than what Jesus Christ brings with his presence, and we are brought into that presence each day through his word and each week in worship. Each of us does well to take the same approach as this crowd with the hope and the confidence that they display as Jesus draws near to them. We need to be near to him, when we, as we continue to find ourselves in the midst of great dis debate, disruption, and disagreement. Just a quick look at the events unfolding over the past couple of weeks shows this to be true. We have seen the recent reinstatement of a divisive fast face mask ordinance in the city of Racine, which offers great distraction and discord even within Christian congregations. Just this past Thursday, we were informed about vaccination mandates coming from the White House for a great number of working people throughout our nation, and this moved the argument from the outside of people's faces even into their bodies. A highly charged political reaction continues to unfold over the so-called right to end a person's beating heart after its detection, as those 63 million legal murders in this country since 1973 hasn't been enough. There's also been the continued chaos and cleanup that followed a slow-moving hurricane across many states in our nation, and in its wake we find continued attempts to politicize natural disasters and argue about their origins. And then, of course, yesterday, our nation just passed the 20-year anniversary of horrible violence and mass murder visited upon our land which further proved that human beings hate each other and regularly look for ways to hurt each other even beyond argument. As Christians, we know that there is no human solution to the many sinful and painful disunities and calamities that we find in this broken world. And so like the crowd in this passage, we do well to excitedly run up to and greet our Lord as He speaks to us through His Word, and he does it right here in the divine service. Any approach other than a plain application of his word will further divisions and tarnish our witness. Despite the inability of his disciples to drive out the violent and unclean spirit, 
Jesus now takes up the challenge himself. He cries out, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. He sees what is at the heart of the problem, and he decides to address it head on. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often thrown him into fire and into water to destroy him. This boy, poor boy has suffered for what appears to be the majority of his life, as something evil within him has made many attempts to kill him. The problem presents itself clearly once he is brought to Jesus, and yet the cause is made clear only by Jesus' question. He points to the faithlessness of those around him. The disciples and scribes, their opponents, were more concerned with showing their exorcistic prowess or their powers of debate than with looking to the only power over evil and the only source of truth. His disciples engaged in this just as we do today, with the world and at times even with each other. The world is wrong in its desire to follow its power-hungry and murderous ways, and we can stand on God's Word and proclaim it lovingly to them in our words, in our actions, and at times even with our votes. This is our best response to the world's attacks, and our only defense is the faith worked in our hearts by God's grace through His Word and Spirit. Any other source that we might look to will lead to what we see here in our reading. Jesus has identified and called out the faithlessness of those around Him. He shows this to be the source of suffering and at times even an invitation for evil to come and dwell among us. The boy's bro father brought him first to his disciples and now to Jesus himself. And after offering some context, he put forth his sheepish request. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. There's that word, if. His years of watching this truly scary interplay between his son and a demon perhaps coupled with the inability of both the scribes and Jesus' disciples to drive it out and the ensuing argument, have most likely chipped away at this man's confidence that relief could ever come. If you can, Jesus responds, all things are possible for one who believes. Faith is believing in things not seen. The father of this boy has seen no relief for his son or for his family. He has seen great divisions arise between those attempting to bring it. He offers up this weak confession of faith, hoping that somehow Jesus could do more than he had already seen. And yet he throws the conditional if into the request. Jesus does not hesitate to address that if. He repeats it and then proclaims that faith is the saving agent in any person's life. His word draws out a stronger confession and one that we do well to share in as well. The Father says, I believe. Help my unbelief. The crowd drew closer and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. The boy was granted relief that his father had sought and in this exorcism we see also a preview of Jesus' authority over death. Those gathered near to him thought the boy was dead. And yet Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. He was able to do this because he holds all things in his hand. And yet he submitted to the Father's will and plan that is spelled out for us throughout the Scriptures. A scene such as this reminds us of our ever-present need to make use of God's Word and also of his constant and powerful presence in our lives as the source of the faith that saves us. Our faith looks to him who was lifted up from the ground on the cross and who arose three days later, walking out of his tomb, as the victor over sin and death. But that faith of ours wrestles with unbelief, and it can only arise victorious through our use of God's means of grace, holy baptism, holy communion, and the holy scriptures. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe, you will be saved. If you believe, you have faith. If you have faith, you will wrestle with unbelief. The world around you will not offer anything helpful, and it will try to drag you into its petty and at times very dangerous disagreements with one another, and of course, with the very Word of God. The Christian response to this reality is to draw near to where Jesus promises to be found and to apply His Word where it is fitting. It is not easy. In fact, it is a constant battle. I believe Help my unbelief. Pray that prayer today and every day until you see your Savior face to face. Amen. We stand and sing the offertory on page 192.